Good evening. This is Moishi Frank with Frank News. We're here live or recorded with former Fox News analyst Bruce Backman. And the question today we have, <coughs> excuse me, is why are the liquor stores open and the house of worship, the shoals, etc., are closed? Bruce, tell us. I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 it's, you know, there's still a need for mitigation at this point of certain things with um, the face mask, conceivably the, you know, the sanitation standards, the hygiene things that we've been doing, the hand washing um, of the like, plus the social distancing, which has been definitely helpful. Um, I think staying home was helpful at some point too, at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, especially to make sure that hospital capacity was able to keep up with the uh, number of people who would be needing care due to the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Um, but things have changed a lot in the last two months. And I think that it's time to start to open up everything. And when I say everything, I mean pretty much everything. I think there has to be, we have to figure out ways of doing those things. And I think there's a lot of protocol stuff to be discussed in between government um, officials and but mainly between small business owners and large business owners and public transportation if necessary and 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 the like but but little by little we have to start opening everything up the liquor stores never had to close the synagogues did the churches did uh, restaurants did clothing stores did shoe stores did uh, a lot of things had to close and now those businesses are very much in jeopardy going into the future and the question is why the synagogue closed and liquor stores open? The honest answer is, I don't know. Because what do you, what do you uh, suspect? The liquor lobby is very powerful. Uh, maybe they thought there would be an insurrection of people if they couldn't have access to liquor. It lets you know what our elites think of us, that they made sure that liquor and CBD were very much readily available while other items were deemed non-essential. Liquor is not essential in my life. Um, I guess it could be essential in somebody's life. Uh, but it's not essential in mine. And it wouldn't be the most important thing to leave open in the time of a pandemic. But, you know, that was the decision the government made. And they made a smart decision on a lot of things related to the synagogues and the schools and the like. But we know a lot more about the virus now. We know a lot more about how it gets spread. We know a lot more about who's in danger of suffering consequences for it. We also know that there are possibly ways of treating the virus, despite what Dr. Fauci and some of his cohorts are saying. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is by far mixed with zinc and zithromycin, better known as the ZPAC, has been very effective and has been used all over the world with very good results. The study is going to be coming out in a few weeks um, with Dr. Zelenko, who's been working on it with St. Francis Hospital here on Long Island. And we're going to find out how effective it really is. And my understanding is, is that it is very effective. And if given early, it could really save lives. And it could cause save people from even having to go to the hospital in the first place. And we're talking so big numbers. So you're saying a month ago, really, uh, if you just isolate the high risk vulnerable people, we should have reopened. Well, I think that in Florida, you know, New York, everybody, you know, they made Governor Cuomo America's governor, but really, Governor DeSantis is far more America's governor. You know, he really made the focus in Florida on um, isolating and protecting old age homes. Uh, seniors facilities and the like, and they haven't had a very big death toll. And I still remember watching on TV and he did a press conference, I think this week, showing how everybody was saying that it was going to be ground zero for this crisis. And it never happened because he did all the smart things where as our governor, who everybody just swoons over, you know, was people, seniors who were taken out of nursing homes, were tested for COVID-19, then were sent back to those nursing homes spreading the virus even further to vulnerable populations. I mean, that's, that, I don't know what's an impeachable offense, but that definitely doesn't warrant somebody to be um, admired significantly for his handling of this crisis. You know, if you do the smart things, the real mitigation, real mitigation isn't just face masks and uh, six feet apart in the supermarket. Real mitigation is identifying people who are really in danger of suffering the effects of the virus and making sure that we protect them and keep them away from getting the virus. That should be the first and most important thing, not locking up and quarantining healthy people, which was for some reason something we did first and foremost in New York. 
So practically speaking, we should open up restaurants today. And we just want to make we sure should the table open up six everything. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, that, that, I'm not qualified to give an answer on that. Um, but there are techniques we can do. Dr. Fauci up until recently was very much saying that face masks aren't even required. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting tickets in New York City for $1,000 if you're not wearing one in the street. You know, and they write on the ticket, like, due to the executive order of the mayor. Like, that's going to hold any weight when you go and appeal it. You know, I, I would take a court like that as high as it could go. I would take a, a ticket like that as high as I could go if I had time for it. Um, I don't think that our civil liberty, I don't think that the mayor or the governor the small, have the right to do that. This, why aren't the small business owners rising up and fighting? They're scared of the fines and the tickets. They don't have, they, they, they've lost enough and they're scared of getting fines and tickets and they don't want to pay them. I actually went to visit Peter Elliott's store in Manhattan, who was the first menswear store in the city to open up. And I bought something, I mean, very nominal amount, but I wanted to support him because I said it's pretty gutsy for a man of his age to open his store, um, you know, in this climate. And when I say climate, I'm not simply speaking about pandemic. I'm speaking about this, the climate of fear and pandemia that we've been experiencing in New York and around much of the country, especially in the rest of the country where the virus isn't really as much of a danger as it is here. Obviously here, mitigation and ma standards have to be done simply because of the sheer number of people who live in New York City and how we live kind of on top of each other. Bruce, what do you think about schools? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not into like the coronavirus as a hoax. I'm just like, we have to learn how to live with the coronavirus so we don't bankrupt our society for many, many years to come. Like the president said, the cure should not be worse than the disease, right? No, the cure and the and like the and like doctors, you know, always used to say, the first thing is do no harm. You know, we've done a lot of harm, you know, and then you have like anchors on television on all the networks saying, how anybody who goes to work, I mean, they're, they're going to kill people. And the governor, such hubris to say that like if you don't wear a mask, you know, you're going to kill people. Like, what is he talking about? I mean, we know that the, if you don't, if you don't have to wear a mask. And then in the same time, it says if you can't wear it, if you can't, so it's all confusing. And people understand that there's something funny and fishy going on. Most people are sensing that it's not all right. Now, they'll say, well, a lot of things government does isn't right. But this one in particular is a real standout. Didn't the government come with reports in the 90, two days ago, 96% of the people in hospitalized have underlying conditions? Yes, and he also said that 66% of the new hospitalizations in New York uh, are people who have been homebound for the last uh, six to eight weeks, which he didn't understand. And only 1% of the people are essential workers who've been going out every day. But he's not going to act on that report, is he? No, but I mean, it begs the question whether the lockdown is effective anymore. I mean, you have to wonder if 66% of the new hospitalizations in New York City are people who've been homebound, are the lockdown still necessary? I mean, it's not a difficult question to ask. I mean, there is a lot of pain in a lot of families, in a lot of businesses, in a lot of communities right now, what this lockdown has wrought. This lockdown was a serious crisis in a series of places in America, New York City, Boston, Detroit, um, New Orleans, perhaps Chicago, but it wasn't a crisis everywhere. It was something to be wary of, to be cautious of, to take precautions for, but at the same time, it was also that one should just move on with their businesses and their lives. We shouldn't bankrupt a store in Wyoming because New York City has a, has a coronavirus epidemic that's ravaging Central Queens. Do you think I can assure you, I can assure you that if there was a pandemic ravaging Jackson, Wyoming, we wouldn't close down New York. So why are we doing it the other way around? Do you think schools should be open for us? I think schools could be open. I think we should try our best to open them. And I think the only reason they're not open now is because the teachers' unions threaten to go on strike. And it's just too many fights to handle at one time. Teachers are home now, being paid. Some are working on Zoom, some are not. And they have no interest to go back to school. Is safety a component and fear is a component? Sure. But you know, we also know that we can't find a child on the face of the earth who's, who's under 10 years old who's transmitted the virus to an adult. That's not me saying that. That's a lot of studies. They can't find it. They think the children may transmit the virus to the adults. They're not sure. They think it's possible, but they still haven't proven it. Furthermore, we also know that children rarely suffer real effects of the virus. You know, if any, you know, children are much more, the flu is a much greater threat to children than this virus is. 
I mean, and that's, you, you, the CDC says that themselves. John Ioannidis at Stanford University said the same. I said, you know, this virus is a threat to middle-aged people to a certain degree and definitely older people, but children not as much. They never closed the schools in Singapore. They opened the schools in Japan over a month ago, month and a half ago, uh, probably a month and a week ago. They, ne they never closed the schools in Sweden. They never closed the schools really in South Korea. You know, they reopened the schools in Germany. I mean, the schools are being opened all over. Quebec is trying to open the schools, but he's dealing with a challenge with unions. Israel, Israel reopened government. their schools. Israel's a unique case. They handled the crisis differently than other places. It's a smaller country. People don't, it, it's unique, but they still open their schools and, and their schools were open for a large part of the crisis too. You know, they only closed the, in the, in the ultra Orthodox areas. They only got closed a little bit later and not in the Orthodox communities in general, but I'm not an expert on that. I don't want to be quoted on it, but, but we can go that other countries didn't close their schools, especially for primary age children. I mean, you, you know, locking children up in the house for long periods of time has consequences too. You know, canceling elective surgeries at hospitals, including things like chemotherapy, brain surgeries, cancer screenings, those have adverse consequences. We may not know what they are today, but one could imagine that somebody could have missed out on a vital cancer screening and he could be rising up the level from stage three to four and it could have been caught and dealt with. And he was, they, they, doctors are also nervous that People are scared to go to the hospital to think they're going to get coronavirus and they could be developing other diseases and, and viruses. And, and I, heard the health I, about. I heard the health insurance companies are making a lot of money now because people aren't using their insurance. They're staying out and they're going to doctors. Yeah, and the government's picking up a lot of the bill for the coronaviruses as well, especially for the people who aren't insured. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mess and it's dangerous. And yeah, the virus is dangerous, but at the same time, we have to learn to live with the virus. And the, the talk of vaccine, vaccine, vaccine um, as being the panacea to everything, we don't have a vaccine today. We don't know if the vaccine they're coming up with is safe. It has to go through a lot of testing. It's being rushed. Rushed vaccines historically haven't done very well. I'm sorry to say that. And if you can look back at the vaccine efforts under the Ford administration, it was Washington Post piece, about how that vaccine didn't work out all that well. I'm talking from 30 or 40 years, 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago. Are there 20, 30 mutations anyway for this virus and therefore it would be almost impossible. To and we've also it. never made a successful virus for the SARS virus that was able to go onto market. Vaccine. It was also dangerous and it had to be pulled. I mean, we're promising people things that aren't necessarily gonna be possible, which is scary unto itself because people are gonna be so desperate for anything to like go back to quote unquote their normal life that, you know, rushing, it could, the, this is one of those cases where the cure really could be worse than the disease, literally. I'm not just talking from an economic perspective, also from a health perspective. You know, all the, all the experts, and I'm not coming at this like the vaccine, you shouldn't, you know, just, you have to start asking smart questions. You know, and, and, and there's a lot of information out there about, about how we can get out of this pandemic and how it's gonna end. And there's a lot of threats on our liberties too. I mean, our liberties have been constrained and taken away from us in the name of public health more than probably at any time, definitely in my lifetime and the lifetime of my parents. Nobody ever has a memory of, you know, people giving you tickets for not adequately social distancing in public areas, you know, not wearing masks in public places, you know, threatening to close down stores and beauty parlors, you know, in Texas and all different kinds of states where the virus isn't really an issue. You know, it, it, one has to ask whether this is the right way to go about what we're doing. And I want to know when I'm getting my rights back because I want my rights back. I think everybody should want their rights back. The rights that are enshrined in the First Amendment, uh, the Bill of Rights. And a lot of them now are being pulled away. And they're being pulled away in the name of public health. And I'm not really sure it's making us really healthier. Uh, someone's got to explain it to me. Because I haven't seen data that, 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 that makes sense or necessary necessity of a lot of these things. If you actually read the data, you wouldn't be so favorable towards lockdowns. But the hysteria and the panic and the fear, they just, they just continue. <clears throat> you know, they perpetuate and they go and they go and they go. And people are scared. I don't blame them. I was scared. And I'm still a little bit scared. But I also understand that, you know, you know you, we have to learn how to live our lives. And we have to live our lives and we have to go back to our lives the way they were before.
And I refuse to listen to politicians who say we can't have our lives back as we had them. That's not acceptable. I want my life back the way it was. I want my children back in school. I want to be able to go and conduct my business, meet with my clients, make money, pay my mortgage, pay my bills, pay my health insurance, and all the rest of those things. And if the government isn't trying to do that as soon as possible, in the safest possible way, without taking away more of my rights and more of my liberties, I'm not interested. So you're going to move out of New York? I think a lot of people are going to move out of New York if there's no schools come the fall. I mean, people have to ask what, what these, what, what, how we're going to have our schools and our camps. You know, I'm all for mitigation and safety precautions. But at the end of the day, there are people who don't even want to go that far of even trying to do those things. I mean, the mayor was on record this week saying he wants to open up the city in September. Uh, Dr. Fauci was talking to leaders of the Jewish community, the Orthodox Union, talking about how they're going to do contact tracing before people go into the synagogues on the holidays. Who the hell appointed him in charge of this? He's not a Dayan. He's not a Rebbe. Who the hell needs him? I don't want him. I don't want his advice on this. That's not for him to decide. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I'm more interested in Shavuos. By Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I'm going to Shul. And the truth of the matter is, we can have outdoor minyanim right now. Get me a health expert to debate me. I don't care how brilliant he is. And tell me the dangers of 10 people six feet apart with masks on making a minion anywhere outdoors, anywhere in America. Tell me where and how it's dangerous. I want to know. Because then we should shut down the lines at Costco. We should shut down the lines outside of CVS. We should shut down our supermarkets indoors. Forget outdoors. We should, we should, we should, we should make lines. We should do a lot of things. Fear is precipitating us to take actions which are totally unprecedented. And I'm going to add this, unnecessary. You know what? I asked somebody recently who was in on a call with some rabbis who were discussing it, and they're very concerned that maybe we don't know how to social distance yet. I think we know how to social distance. We've been practicing for the last two months. You know, I think we've actually become quite good at it. And I think we're ready to <laughs> gradually go back to regular life. And hopefully when the virus disappears, like all viruses do, we'll go back to our regular lives in every way, shape, and form. But in so, the meantime, we should try to live our regular lives anyway. So what's the next move? Should it be small businesses, people uh, making Everything, choices? Everything should up? open as Everything fast as it can. Everybody could should they arrest, open up right away. Could they arrest people open or they just give you a fine? I don't know. We haven't really seen. One guy opened in Manhattan. He was a veteran from the military. He was an older man. They probably didn't want to arrest him. Um, but who's to say what they're going to do? They seem to be indiscriminately targeting <coughs> neighborhoods and communities and how they're enforcing these social distancing things. Um, and a lot of it doesn't really make sense. Like, why do I have to wear a mask outdoors if I'm social distancing? I don't think I do. I, I, is there a reason for it? I mean, they can't really find much evidence of outdoor transmission, especially if you're not really near other people who are strangers. You know, if we're in, and, and in a lot of, you know, I'll tell you something. I was um, in Manhattan. I took someone to the doctor just last week. Finally, after waiting seven weeks for an elective procedure, which wasn't elective, it was uh, cancer related, um, but it became elective in pandemia. Um, although abortion procedures never became elective, which is just amazing. But the cancer procedure, cancer screenings, biopsies, all that stuff was put off. But abortion, Planned Parenthood never shut its doors. Even in Michigan, where you couldn't buy gardening supplies and paint. Um, and I noticed that at the, I saw the doctor. I, was, I waited outside on the car because I wasn't allowed to go into the doctor's office. And I know who the doctor is. And he came out with another person. Could have been a nurse. Could have been another person who worked there. The two of them were talking. They weren't social distancing. They shared a cab, an Uber, to go uptown, probably somewhere else, maybe to leave, who knows. But I know that was the doctor, and I know that wasn't his spouse because um, I, I know who his spouse is. I, I know the doctor. And I'm like, what does the doctor know that I don't know? He's able to get in a cab with someone who's not his family member and go uptown with them, but I'm not able to do a lot of things. What does he know that I don't know? I ask this question all the time to people. What do I, they know that I don't know? People are not asking the right questions. Constantly, we're constantly- Bruce, what do you mean the fact that the, the city workers or first responders um, have daycares for themselves? 
I pointed that out to you. We were speaking about it last week. There are first responder daycares, and ironically, all the people in the daycares happen to be people who donate, many of them, to the Democratic Party and or are unions who endorse Democratic Party candidates. It's, it's, it's child care for people who are in line. Not everybody made the list, and not all essential workers are on that list. If you own a, a deli or a small grocery store that's open, your children, as far as I know right now, do not qualify to go to those preschools. So you have to figure out what you're doing with childcare while you keep your business afloat in this crisis. But if you're one of a series of unions and government workers, well, hey, you get childcare. And it's great hours too. I think it's like 7.30 in the morning or eight in the morning till six at night. It's fantastic coverage for somebody who has to work. And then they tell us that schools are unsafe. Obviously they can't be unsafe if we figured out how to do childcare for all the essential workers' children. And essential workers, by the way, just so you know, if children are carriers of the virus, just a question. You're putting all these essential workers' children under one roof, and then they go home at night to other essential workers, and they could conceivably spread the virus to other essential workers, which may not allow them to go do their essential work. But then it just doesn't the, make any sense. That only 1% of the essential workers actually got corona, right? No, but I really want to talk about the civil liberty stuff. It's very important that people understand that we have to speak up and ask questions about the attack on our civil liberties as Americans in this country right now. It is a crime. We, we went along with it because we wanted to save lives and Americans are patriotic good people by and large and by nature. It's, it's, it's part of the credo of being an American. I really believe that. But at some point, things don't make sense anymore. And then we wonder what's going on. It's one thing when somebody calls you up for a loan because they need to pay their mortgage. And then you see them taking that money and taking a cruise or going to Club Med. Then you have to start to ask some questions. What's going on? What's going on? Why are we doing these things? Why do they keep moving the goalposts on lifting the lockdown? Why were they honest exactly, with us in the first place? What do you say about these? As long, what, didn't they make some type of timeline? If the hospital emissions go down, it wasn't very familiar though? Every day the, 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 they keep on moving. I'm telling you right now, they'll go down to zero people and they still won't open it. They won't, there'll be people fighting to keep the lockdown on because the virus is still roaming around. So do you think there's a political incentive? I definitely the think there's a political incentive to remake this country. They're very blatant about it. Hillary Clinton has been on record saying that, you know, Rahm Emanuel, the former chief of staff to President Obama, said clearly, uh, maybe a month and a half, two months ago, or maybe more, he said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. He always used to say that. Hillary Clinton, when she endorsed Joe Biden, said that this gives us an opportunity to remake America. All of these liberal and left-wing politicians are using the crisis and this pandemic, which has hurt so many people from a health perspective, from a financial perspective, from loss of life, so significantly in so many different ways as an opportunity to push their agendas. The agenda of our leaders should be to open our country up as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, so we can get on with our business. Remaking our country is not the top priority. Adding all these new things in and taking more and more civil liberties is not the top priority. People must speak out. This is dangerous. There's attacks on freedom of speech. There are videos going on the internet talking about, you know, conspiracy theories related to the, to, to, to the pandemic, to the coronavirus pandemic. I can't vouch that everything they're saying is true or untrue, but I could tell you this, they shouldn't get pulled down. There's plenty of hate speech on YouTube and on Facebook against Jews and African Americans and other religious minorities, and they're not so eager to pull that stuff down. You could go online now and I could show you tons of videos that be pulled down that are dangerous, very dangerous, spreading true hatred, these things are just questioning public policy and calling out some factual, unusual things related to some of the things that are going on right now. I don't know all the details of them, but I know that people are entitled to see them if they're truthful. If YouTube wants to pull it down, then they should be much firmer about pulling down other things. But truthfully, I don't think anything should be pulled down. I truly believe in freedom of speech. I believe that good speech beats bad speech. And I believe that if you have a good argument, you should be able to speak at the, uh, at the top of your tongue, at the top of your voice, on, on mountaintops, telling people what you think and you believe. That's what America's all about. 
And when we start cutting off debate and we start cutting off opposing views and people who question, you know, official party lines of certain industries related to pharmaceuticals, related to the way the government's function, the CDC and others, it's very, very dangerous. Because if we don't have an honest debate about issues relating to all of our lives, then we are doing ourselves a great disservice and a great danger for the future. America has to be the land of the brave and it has to be the land of the free. And if you don't want it to be those things, well then too damn bad, because those things are, based, are enshrined in rights that we have in the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. And it's very important that people speak up and do not silence voices of dissent in this time. Democrats and left-wingers had no problem, and I supported them when they were dissenters against George W. Bush when he took this country into the Iraq War, and they had legitimate criticisms and complaints. I mean, in retrospect, they were right about a lot of things. But I never thought they should have been shut down. I worked at the Fox News Channel for many, many years. There are people who like it or they don't like it. But I don't remember ever us having a meeting or a discussion about making silencing people intentionally. Freedom of speech is a real thing. I just want my seat at the table so I could say what I think. And let the people decide. That's what we have elections for. That's what we have debates for. But now we have a powerful group of people who don't want to have honest debate about issues. They want to shut things down. They want to stop it. They want to close it. And it's all in the name of misinformation. Who's to decide what misinformation is? And it isn't. And if you're going to have that standard, let's apply it equally everywhere if it's so important to you. But you don't. So the question is, why are you doing it here? Is it really about human life? Is it really about safety or is it about something else? Is it, in history of the past, have we seen governments use a pandemic as a way to uh, make big changes? We've seen governments use crises as a way to make big changes. I wouldn't say pandemic per se, the 1918 flu was a rare situation. It was a long time ago. I'm not an expert in it. And it was also, you know, the greatest pandemic in history. This is not the 1918 flu, despite whatever they tell you. People may carry themselves like it was, but the death toll in that was inordinate. I mean, in the United States alone, I mean, and all over the world. But it also had a lot to do with poor hygiene, um, you know, the way we lived in those years. It was a different time. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the, you know, nutritionally, we were, were eating better today in some respects. You know, there was a lot more poverty, child poverty. It was a different time. You know, it's an important conversation to have. But at the same time, it's, I don't know. We're always talking about the, this is the 1918 flu. I mean, I, I don't think everything's relatable. I think you have to look at everything on the merits of where you are right now. You know, we've locked down so many countries on the face of the earth, and many countries have a handful of deaths and a handful of cases. A lot of the countries we're locking down like that are very poor countries where people, you know, work to eat. You know, the old saying, they go fish for their dinner. And I don't know if that's a very good idea. And I don't know what the ramifications and long-term consequences of those things are going to be for those places. Those, th those things are not going to have good consequences here. So you can only imagine what's going to happen in a country that's very poor. But we have well, to so have a conversation Bruce, about our civil liberties. Yeah, you spoke about Sweden keeping these open. Is it still the same? Sweden has, as of now, I think they have a loss of over 3,000 lives. They had a very sharp uptick, actually, this week. Um, but it'll probably, I mean, they've had them before where it goes up and down. They've lost more lives than their neighboring countries. But the Swedes are also much closer to herd immunity than any other country in Europe. So once you reach herd immunity, then life genuinely can go back to true normal. Uh, is, is everything open there or the things are closed up? There? They never closed everything. They made limitation and mitigation things, but they argued that in a liberal democracy, well, their, their government doesn't permit, their constitution, I think, doesn't permit the use of emergency powers to deny people of basic um, civil liberties as far as mobility and things. They have a different, their setup is different. Our emergency powers seem to allow government to take more powers. However, I really actually don't think a lot of what the governments have done will stand up if it went to court. I'm not really sure where they get the rights to these, especially as it relates to religious institutions like churches and synagogues and mosques. I, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a constitutional uh, attorney. Just from a stupid a perspective, why can every person uh, decide they want to go outside, they can decide they want to go to work, decide to open the store, you can decide question. you want to walk into the store, no one actually comes to the store. You're not forcing them to the store and let things go. 
I don't know why the government is involved here. Who should go outside? Who should go outside? How to go outside? If you're paranoid, stay home. If you're not paranoid, go out. Because obviously, the I mean, I mean, not I, there's there's really you know, it's a lot about power. There's a lot about power going on right now. There's a lot of power. You guys, people have to remember, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you also have to remember what David Ben Gurion used to say about experts. Ben Gurion used to say that if experts tell you if 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 you don't like if the experts tell you it's not possible, get new experts. I think we need new experts. I think the experts we've had haven't done a service to this country. Um, at least they're not doing it anymore. I think it's time for new leadership. Um, you know, I don't know, and I think the president's making the right decision to making this a local decision. I think he's realizing, I mean, I think he may have always known it, but I think he's realizing that every state is different, every town is different, every city is different, and they have to determine what works best for the citizens within which they live. You know, lo, you know, all politics are really local at the end of the day. I don't know if the standards of New York City should be the standards of uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, or, know, or you Fargo. Do. I don't think they should be. Oh, you don't know? Okay. No, I don't think they should be. Do I, do I know why? What was the question again? I'm sorry, maybe I digressed. Um, I really forgot. <laughs> no, you had a good question. You were asking me why you shouldn't be able to go out. I think you should be able I to said, go why out. Why can everyone just do whatever they want? Whoever is concerned, just like if you're afraid to to get in the car because it's I think unsafe. you should be. I think I think I think you. I think people you, I think are you afraid to to fly. Don't fly. People are afraid to drive a car. Shouldn't drive a car. And that's it. People are afraid to send their children to school. Keep your kids home. People are afraid to go to day camp. Keep your kids home from day camp. I don't know why the choice. government gets involved in the decision making. I actually don't know why the government. Well, I think initially it was this very big concern that hospitals would not be able to keep up with the flow. And I was very much on board with that. You know, I started questioning what was going on when I saw them. And this is a controversial thing to say, but I saw them padding death tolls. You know, they are padding death tolls. They are going through records and they're putting people and saying that they had the coronavirus. And it's very possible many of them didn't. I'm going to add, I know three personal cases of people who lost loved ones and their death certificates say coronavirus. And each of them is adamant and confident and was told prior to their death that they didn't die of coronavirus. But once you walk into a hospital in coronavirus time, everybody died of coronavirus. Then they found that there was people who passed away that they didn't record. So they assumed that even though they're not going to test them, there's no autopsies. These people could have either been buried or cremated. Doesn't make a difference. They're putting them in the numbers. We keep on bulking up these numbers. I asked this question as a political researcher for 20 years. Why? Why would anybody have an incentive to bulk up death tolls in a crisis? And if, and if we should do that, let's wait till the end of the crisis when it's over and we'll, the dust will settle and we're able to do this more objectively. We're not doing this objectively now. It's a free-for-all, and I don't know why. And when I saw that happening, I started questioning everything because I knew right away something was up. And I also noticed they weren't doing it in every place, in every state. It seemed to be done in certain places, New York, Virginia, uh, Boston. Um, not every state was Bruce, doing what's it. the call to action from this conversation? What should people do? The should call they open their to action is they call their should open their businesses. Should they, okay. they should push their schools to open. They should push their camps to open and they should push their, their, their they, should, they should go back to work and they should demand a return of their civil liberties and, and their rights to each and every American citizen as given to them in the Bill of Rights and enshrined there. The government does not have the right to do what it's doing. It, we agreed to it. But now it's time to take our rights back. And my big so thing right now is our rights are not going to be taken. We're not going to get all our rights back because we have politicians like Governor Newsom in California, Governor Cuomo to a certain degree in New York, Mayor de Blasio, and many others who aren't that interested to give us our rights back. And they're not basing their decisions on science anymore. They're based on fear, hysteria, and insanity. And people are so scared that they're going along with it. In times of fear and crisis, you can get people to agree to almost anything. But eventually they wake up and the morning comes and they look outside and they say, what the hell's going on? And before you know it, that same person who gave somebody something 
is chasing them down the street with a broomstick. Get out of my house. Get out of my family. Get out of my community. Get out of my synagogue. Get out of my business. Don't tell me how to make a living. You don't pay my bills. You don't pay my mortgage. Who the hell do you think you are? We're not there yet, but there's a lot of people that are very concerned when that day comes and the anesthesia wears off because right now everybody's been given money in this and in that and, and TPP and EIDL and unemployment insurance and stimulus and this and that, but the anesthesia will wear off and it's going to hurt. I wish it wouldn't, but I think it's going to hurt and people are going to be mad and they're going to be frustrated and they're going to have questions and they're going to want their rights back and they're going to have politicians who don't want to give their rights back because politicians got used to having so much power over their day-to-day -day lives, like giving you tickets for not wearing face masks on the street or not adequately social, social distancing in public places or, or opening up a business which was deemed not to be in the national interest. This is not American. This is not right. And this is, this is dangerous. Yeah, and this I is don't the whole say world, it's right? dangerous that you should be like, oh my God, let's go and hurt people dangerous. We need to demand from our leaders in emails, phone calls, sharing messages with our friends, any way we know how, to get the message out that we need our rights back. And when the virus subsides, we want all the rights back we used to have. We don't want the, the government to come up with new excuses to keep our rights. There's talk of medical passports that the only people will be allowed to travel are people that have passports saying their medical safety. I don't know. Bill Gates in the Scientific American in January, you can go read the piece, was lauding and putting money behind tattooing our children about which vaccines they've had. And then it would be read by ultraviolet lights or some kind of lights. It'll be implanted in their skin permanently, the vaccine they had. We're becoming numbers. People say it's conspiracy theories. I don't need to go to the conspiracy theorists to go find this information. Go listen to what they're saying. Go listen to their talk of medical passports, tattooing our children with what vaccines they've had, all in the name of public health, and all tremendous overreaches of our rights as American citizens. We do not have to do these things, but people are using this pandemic as an excuse to do things they never would have been able to get people to even consider otherwise. And it's all being done in the name of fear and hysteria. And it's not being done in the name of honest public debate and dialogue. Let's have an honest debate about these things. If you think they're a good idea, whoever you are, Dr. Fauci, Bill Gates, other intelligentsia people around the world who are pushing for these things in the media, like the Scientific American and others, let's talk about it. Let's have a debate about it, a real one. Not where what I say gets censored, not where a person who puts a video on the internet, it gets pulled down within 24 hours because she diverted from the party line with sourceable evidence in many cases. I'm a researcher. I always go back and check the source. And when I see sources, I get nervous. You know why? Because then I, and then I see when they pull down stuff that I can source, I get really scared. I'm not trying to scare anybody now. I'm just telling people we need to ask questions. And we don't have to be so docile about it. I'm not saying you should go protest in the street and chase people and hurt people. I'm saying email your congressman, email your assemblyman, call them, ask them, write a letter to the editor to the newspaper, make a post on Facebook or any of the other social media places you use and start to start a conversation or a dialogue on these things. You know, I still believe that Louis Brandeis put it best when he said that the best disinfectant, sunshine is the best disinfectant, sunlight or sunshine. Let's put light on everything. Let's have an honest talk about it. If it gets proven that we need these things and there's an honest debate that takes into account our civil liberties and our constitution and our rights as Americans and our needs as Jewish Americans who have religious protections in the constitution, let's have those conversations. But I don't agree to contact tracing in shul. I'm not bringing my cell phone to synagogue on the Sabbath to be contact traced so they'll know that I came into the synagogue and who I was in contact with. I'm sure there's going to be some people who are going to find excuses to put these things in. I want, I want to know how it's permissible halacha in halacha. These are debates that are going to come now. And these are major infringements on our rights. And we lived, we've lived thousands of years without a lot of these things. And to, with all due respect, we've done just fine.
Now they'll say otherwise, oh no, this will save lives. It's always about saving lives. Well, this virus has also cost lives. There's an uptick in suicide. There's an uptick in drug abuse. There's an uptick in alcohol abuse. There's, le- there's people who weren't able to get elective surgeries for the last seven or eight Bruce, weeks. I spoke to uh, one of my clients who has one of the largest distribution of uh, cannabis accessories. He says he's never been busier. No, and that was actually determined. For, it's amazing. For, for decades upon decades, it was illegal, and now it's an official business. Now, 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 now it's perfectly legal to do. Um, not only that, it was determined essential more essential than a toy store. My children have been locked up in my house now for about seven or eight weeks. Zoom, tele, my, my daughter's young. It's very hard for her to do the Zoom classes. And she would love to go to the toy store or us go you to the buy, You go to Target, Bruce. You go to Target. Well, that's another problem. We're creating, we're creating monopolies where we only have three or four stores open where you can buy everything. And when you only open those three or four stores, you're killing all small businesses at their expense. I told you this before. I think there should be a sales tax holiday for all the small businesses that were closed by the government. I don't think that pe- I think people should not only buy in those stores. I think the government shouldn't take tax revenue from those purchases in those stores, incentivizing people to shop in the small business that got screwed by this. And when people say, don't say they got, they got screwed. They got really screwed. Many of those businesses aren't even going to be able to survive despite the government bailout money. Because if there's no customers to go to the stores, it's not going to happen. Not all businesses are online. Not everybody likes to buy on the internet. Some people like to go into a store, talk to their local shopkeeper, ask them questions, touch and feel a product before going home. They like personal relationships with people. They don't want to social distance permanently. They like people. They don't want their daughters and sons in Zoom classes forever. They want them to be in class, playing with their peers, socializing as we always have. We haven't even spoken about the suggestions of the governor and Bill Gates and and their plans for New York State for schools. I don't want my children in Zoom classes anymore. I want them going back to school in classes with teachers and their peers and the socialization and educational benefits they get from it. Like I What about moving to college, getting college to go all online now that people are used to it? Do you have an opinion on that? Or do you think people should go to actual universities? College isn't what it used to be. I don't want to talk about college, but I'll talk about high school. I'll talk about elementary school. There's a conversation to be had whether, whether certain technologies can be used to cut costs. But if cutting costs is going to come at the expense of social interaction between children at their most formative years of when they need the relationships with their peers and their teachers in a real tangible way, that would be the greatest crime. We're going to create a nation of robots. We're going to cease to be human when we take humanity out of life because that's what's happening now. We're not living a human life anymore. When our life consists of Zoom weddings and Zoom bar mitzvahs and Zoom classes, nothing against Zoom. It's a great technology. Whoever made it did a good job, I suppose. But we're taking away what life is all about. It's about hugs. It's about shaking hands. It's about, it's about real interpersonal relationships. And there are people who don't like those things. And they don't like germs. Anthony Fauci said we may want to do away with handshakes. Handshakes have been going back to the Bible. I'd rather do away with Anthony Fauci. Who wants to do away with handshakes? And who's he to do away with handshakes? Does he have scientific evidence that it makes sense to do away with handshakes? I'm sure he'll say there'll be less germs, but we also know that when we expose ourselves to more germs at some point, we also become, it builds up our immunity. I mean, are we gonna be healthier and safer if we lock ourselves up forever, just getting UPS boxes dropped off at the door by robots? Is that what the future of America really holds? Is that the life we really want for ourselves and our children? Who's asking these questions? I'm not even that. I mean, there are people who are talking about these things. I mean, why? There's so much technology. Why should kids be in school all the time? Why do we need all these big buildings? We could save so much money. Why are classes so big? Why, 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 why? Okay, ask the questions. But let's make sure we have an equal debate on the other side about the important benefits of a child being in a school with his peers, about working in an office with other people, not just working online, about brainstorming, about, about the relationships that come from being in, in, a, in, a, in a dynamic work setting. That I like customer service. I like going into a place and talking to somebody. I like people. If you don't like people, don't, don't run my life and don't try to run everybody else's life. I don't wanna make a Zoom prayer service. I wanna make a prayer service in my synagogue and I'm sure there's non-Jews who go to church and mosques wanna do the same. People need to speak up. 
There are people who Thank are trying you. to radically change. One more thing before I go. I know I'm long-winded in these things, but I'm making a plea to people. Wake up, pay attention to what they're telling us will protect us in the future. And make sure you understand that these things are not necessarily going to protect us and they may harm us much more than we expect. And they are dangerous and they are unproven and they are risky. I'm not saying technology is bad, but anything that says that humanity is not good and technology is the answer to everything and isolating people permanently and distancing people permanently until you have a vaccine. Who's to say if you even have a vaccine, if you'll ever have a vaccine? What if they can't find a vaccine? Are we supposed to socially distance for 20 years? <laughs> I mean, let's start coming to terms with reality. This has to stop. Somebody has to speak up. It's enough. It's enough. Thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry for the monologue, but I'm very, very concerned. I'm very upset. And I think a lot of people feel the way I do but they're scared to speak out. So I'm we speaking out to you today because I want me. people to hear this. We hope you do some monologues yourself, self inspired on Facebook. You don't have to wait uh, for these great interviews. No, I, this, I, I just, I feel very strongly about it and I just want to make sure. Not enough to go on video here. yourself. Not enough to go on video yourself. No, I will go on video myself. I just don't know if anybody's going to watch it. You could check me out. Well, you, we got over 3,000. We got over 3,000 views the last time. So it's a well, you can check me out on my Twitter. I think it's at Backman Consult at Twitter. And then you could follow me on Twitter where I post a lot of interesting articles from a lot Facebook? of sources and bloggers and my Facebook page at Bruce Backman. And you'll find me there. It doesn't have a picture of myself, but maybe I'll change that. But I post interesting articles and commentary all the time. Um, it's from my perspective, obviously. But I think a lot of those articles make you think. And I think that we need to think a little bit more than we're thinking right now. You need a little more wisdom. Moshe, you this do a great job all the time. And you're a mensch. Please. I appreciate you having me on. Sure. Okay. This is Bruce Backman and Moshe Frank with Frank News. Until next time. Thank you very much.